January 23rd. The best place to write is... Here. here. The best time to write is... Now. The best people to write are... Us. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. We have a great night of uh, three different performers for you Four this different. evening. Sorry. Four, Four different performers. I was misled. And, <laughs> and then we'll have an open mic afterwards. I am Skylark Bruce, for those of you who do not know, and I think all of you do. Uh, we have... Oh yes, Azrael wanted me to call you fellow sinners. Yes. And ladies and gentle down peoples and persons, beings of all ages, welcome to the Writing Nights Press Presents the Poetry, Open Mic at the Outpost on SR43 Kent, Ohio. Woo! Woo! All yes. right, so we have... Our suggested donation of five dollars, if you are not one of the performers, goes to Ray Nights to pay the features, because you know we're not trying to have people work for us for free. Um, we can also accept payments via PayPal if you are watching online, and we do have our whole Facebook Live thing happening. Um, linked in dis oh, in the link there is a description of this video. Yes, and there's a link to the PayPal payment. Excellent, excellent. So yes, if you go to the link, it'll take you to the right video and the right place to donate money for us. Okay, so I, our first performer of the, oh, I should, before we get on to the performers, we should mention the Azteloud Dos, take two, shall we say. Yes. Uh, because Azteloud, the head-to-head uh, -head series of competitions, championship, of the sword fights that we've been doing. We tried to have it last Saturday, but we had to cancel because our performers kept dropping out because of the horrendous weather conditions. So we are now going to have it on February 23rd, so one month from today. Yay! So uh, one of the very exciting things about postponing it is that we will now have Daria Quinn able to perform with us. And if you are still wanting to get in on that action, we may have some slots available. So our first, oh yeah, and that, and that will be in Canton, and there will be a $5 admission for that as well. It will be, have we, have we confirmed the location, Azrael? It's either going to be Avenue Arts or Makeshift. It's either going to be at Avenue Arts or at Makeshift. So downtown Canton, for sure. Yes. Our first performer of this evening, Cy Castells, is a queer poet and writer from Cleveland. After a long career as a gas station cashier, they have spent the past three years as a full-time student at Cuyahoga Community College and Cleveland State University in hopes of one day going to grad school and continuing to avoid real work. Please welcome to the stage, Cy Castells! <laughs> First one is about my favorite superhero. What's your favorite superhero, everyone? Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Bruce Willis and Unbreakable. Bruce Willis and Unbreakable. <laughs> also Wolverine. Wolverine. Uh, X-Men. X-Men. All of them. Okay. <laughs> this one's about my favorite superhero. Captain Obvious. <laughs> what isn't obvious about Captain Obvious is that he really is a great superhero. His real origin story, he was that little kid who told everyone that the Emperor has no clothes on when nobody else wanted to be the one to say it. He's older now, and so is the world. He points out that global warming is real, that our world is brutally and unnecessarily unjust, that people everywhere are suffering while the richest few contemplate whether saving them would cut into their military budgets. 
that science does not say what the news feeds think it says. That the folks in charge aren't the only people in the world who deserve sympathy and respect. That the president has no clue. Captain Obvious steps into conversations in the bar with your friends and points out that your partner is treating you like shit or your boss can't legally ask you to do that or you really should consider moving out of that apartment with all the lead and cockroaches. He urges you to get that lump checked out, to tell that girl you like her for Pete's sake and reminds you that there isn't only two options to every dilemma you face. And sometimes he just listens to you gripe about your woes and your struggles and your loneliness and your exhaustion and he nods and says, that sounds tough. And you must be tough because you're going through it. Because oftentimes when we're afraid or stressed or depressed or just a little unsure of ourselves, we can't be sure that the obvious is true until it's said out loud. That's where Captain saves the day. He states the obvious because speech is about more than just telling people what they don't already know. It's about confirming what they do know, but we're afraid to say for fear of being wrong. It's about letting the truth shine brighter in dark times. It's about being the voice of us all, as foolish as it might make him look. Because by his foolishness, we are all made wise. Most of these poems have been written in the past few weeks or few months. I don't actually date them, so I'm not sure, sure New exactly. Shit. New shit! Yes. Um, this is about women who look like witches. I love the women who look like witches. With a hooked nose and pointed chin and hair in places you'd expect a man to have. She looks like she might be in, the moon, in on the moon's secrets, and you dare not touch her until she invites you with surprising candor to hold her hand while she flies you out into the night sky. I love women who laugh like witches, an explosion of unrestrained glee, a little frightening if you didn't get the joke, but if you do, you'll know what I mean. I love women whose hair is streaked with gold and silver, but she still wears it long and braids it herself, washed with potions that make it smell like autumn flowers. I love women who act like witches, like maybe they know what lies ahead of you better than you will ever, even after you've walked the whole length of this road, but knows better than to warn you, so you still get to feel like you earned it, even if you didn't. I love women who will read this and shake their heads at my fetish for enigma. Because what I call magic, for them, it is just the air they breathe. And the music they hear in their heads when it rains. I love witches because I'm never sure if I love them for real or because I'm under a spell. And frankly, I don't even care which is which. On a, um, on a slightly related note, I had a, uh, a boss at a gas station who told, told me one of our regular customers was ugly because she looks like a witch. And I was like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> She's one of our nicest customers. How to cut a child's voice right out of the air in front of them. When I was a kid, my mom used to say that a fan was chopping my voice into little bits, and that's why it sounded funny when I spoke to the fan. I never knew you could chop sound like a vegetable, slice, 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 slice. Now it's all small pieces and they're bleeding. My voice is bleeding. That's why everyone can hear the pain in it. 
even when I can't feel the pain. I wondered if the fan could chop the rest of me up, since my voice is part of me, isn't it? I can't stop talking into the fan, even though it means I'll get cut. I keep going back. It cools the pain from my body, cools the meat from my bones, as it slices my voice right out of the air in front of me. It took my voice so completely, even I didn't know it anymore. Hot summer day, cool fan, chopped up sound. My, vo my dad showed me how to tie a string to a fan to see which way it was blowing, except he didn't know it. He thought he was showing me how to use the graphics interface on his work computer. It was the first time I saw the place he worked. I wasn't there to see his work. I wasn't there to see him. I was there to see a drawing of a fan on the screen that he drew in paint when he was bored. Except that he didn't tell me he was bored. He told me something that sounded more noble. As far as I could tell, he was an artist. As far as he could tell, he was an artist. As far as anyone else could tell, he was an accountant. It starts with A and ends with T. And inside, there's all kinds of mysteries you have to be one or the other to see. This is another one about my dad. It's called, On Having an Alcoholic Musician for a Father. A trombone is the sound of my dad's voice. He has another voice, but that one isn't his. That's the voice of his body. The trombone is the voice of his soul. And I love his soul. It is so much more beautiful than anything his body's voice has ever tried to tell me, except for sorry. It begins the moment you try to decide whose need is greater, when you begin to measure blades in drops of blood. It is one thing to trust that the road is safe to cross, knowing accidents can always happen. It is one thing to trust that life is good and must and will go on. It is one thing to trust in God, another to trust in you, whose heart beats as red as mine, whose need is as great as any callous conquerors or any faithless friends. All I ever needed was to keep my blood all on the inside while I danced this poisoned life. Instead, I've gone and handed you my knife in hopes you'd cut me off from every drug I crave. That is what I mean by trust, and that is why I'm here, to make this into more than just a passing casual glance at God. I'll have that knife back now and offer my apologies for ever hoping you could be my master. We are not alive to pay bills. We are alive to incur expenses. The human body's sole function is to convert soil and sea and sunlight into shit and breath and noise and more human bodies. We are not here to justify ourselves. We have no duty to our shareholders to turn a profit or turn in the keys. We are here to take the money and run. We are here to squander that initial investment on copious bread and wine, on trips to the theater and friendships and cheap hookers that only charge you your time and your best approximation of love. We are to love the time we have and not worry whose time we've been wasting on such trivialities as late night conversations with strangers, 
artisanal baked goods and finding that one great book you know is buried somewhere in all these old boxes. We are not here forever. We are here for ourselves and each other. We are here to go and to never, ever come home. In case you hadn't um, gathered, I'm not especially fond of capitalism. And I'm really glad that, the, that that's not necessarily a verboten thing to say these days. I've been writing poetry because everything else is a waste of time. Write a novel? What? And ask a thousand people to spend hours of their precious lives getting invested in characters that aren't even real and wasting tears over their irrelevant struggles? We have novels. Our lives are novels. No. Working industry? What, and hasten the destruction of the world, this precious world that is our last home, making more things that will be bought for more than they're worth and used for less than their useful life only because someone needed to buy something to feel that sense of meaning in their afternoon? No. Study science? It's the noblest tragedy of our time, the chance to be Cassandra, wailing to all of Troy, if, Troy, if it would dare to listen, of the coming Greek calamity. No. Study economics? No. This is why I write poetry. Each of these things wastes a million lives, a million moments of sunlight, just to bring the moment of gotcha that a poem delivers in 14 little lines. This is why I write poetry, and when I can't afford paper, I'll write it in the sand at Edgewater Park, I will write it in the salt on the bar, I will write it in blood on the toilet seat, and I will write it on my skin with my fingernail. It is the least wasteful of all that I do. It is my highest calling, if only because nothing drags it down. This one is from my girlfriend who sadly couldn't make it today. We love you, Jeanette! Skylark loves you. I love you. Y'all would love her if she were here because she's awesome. Woo. If I hesitate to reach out, if I've only ever kissed you goodbye, I want you to know why. I am more afraid of hurting you than of getting hurt. And maybe it's because I'm sick, but I'm not so sick that I want to sit this out. I'm not so sick that I can't hold on. I want to be of use to the world for once. I want to be real. The way your touch makes me solid, brings me back into the world. I love everything that makes you real, that makes you thicker than paper. I should stop making lists to check off of lists of wants and won'ts and if it comes to that's and tell you, you are everything I never wanted and that I want you more than everything I have ever wanted. So this, this next poem is a little bit strange. It's a found poem. Um, and um, a couple of years ago, uh, more than a couple, several years ago, I was in a relationship that was abusive. And I, most of our uh, interaction was online because of reasons. And um, about a year ago, I went through the record of all of our uh, chats. And one of the things I did was I found every single time this person just told me what to do. It's called All the Times You Told Me What to Do. 
Yeah, <laughs> terrific <laughs> as, I am terrific at typing things. <laughs> Try gargling warm salt water. I promise it works really well. Don't make me play nursemaid. I wouldn't mind if you did weed, just nothing harder. Don't do that. With that cost, I think you'd want to split the rent. But you don't want to eat into your savings at the end of the month. I don't feel it makes as much sense as having it lined up in advance. I want you to still have your savings in a year. I'm not saying not to get out. I'm saying to look at lots of alternatives, but to examine all options and alternatives for the short term, then you can look, line up the long term plan you want. I just want to help you explore everything, even talking to your dad about the fact that your mom is making it so that you feel it's impossible to live there. Don't be a motherfucker, hardcore or otherwise. Please use some mouthwash before you kiss me. Try not to even think of it as a prosthesis. Don't be scared. Well, they like that. I just wish you didn't have, have to work it this way. You guys might have to put it to your mother. I think it would be good to wait until after the holidays at least. Well, that's 80 minutes of story, and it's not good to binge on it, lest you be up all night listening. Naturally, you shouldn't, but if the situation were reversed, I'd try to respect your feelings. Don't be confused. Think about it for a minute. I have to take care of something, and we'll be right back. Well, what I'd like you to do is, when you ask a question and I give an answer, examine it, and then say what isn't clear without seeming to panic so much. If you'd let me read it to you, you wouldn't be confused and we wouldn't have had this, the conversation dragged into this tangent. I don't want you to read it. I want to read it to you. Next time you get upset, I'm going to suggest a timeout. Make like a five minute nap. Just forget it. Stop that right now. Could you please take a step back and think outside your head for a second, please? Please try to see how your words could be interpreted from another person's point of view. Would you try to get yourself out of point-counterpoint mode? Another counterpoint, really? Well, would you please take a five-minute breather, get some water, take a potty break, rest your eyes, listen to some music, or get your headspace somewhere else for just five to ten minutes? Well, call and say you're going over to meet them. That way you'll, they know you'll be there. Take a book. Ask for them back, I say. Well, just ask if you and he can sort through them, maybe. It won't take long. Go for it. Yeah, you wanted it. It should be yours. Okay, I don't want you to miss work, obviously. Maybe do some jumping jacks? Don't be sorry. I wasn't even upset. Let's not think about it so much. Okay, but if it tastes like tomato soup, spit it out. I have an idea. Go to sleep, woolly bear. Well, just remember that you don't have to take it all with you. Look, stop getting on the self-loathing spiral. This is called Grandma. It's about my grandma, who passed away a couple years ago, as we all do eventually. Yay, more time to All right, now I'm gonna read. I hear Grandma in his New England accent. I haven't called her that in so long. Not talked to her, not talked about her, except to people who don't know her. Saying, my grandmother. Saying, Grandma Jimmy. Saying, my mom's mom. Not grandma, like it's her name. I hear her in his New England accent. He's from Boston. It's close enough, as diluted as it is, to Connecticut, to my Ohio ears. He's a rare, gentle man. A grandma in professor's clothes. He's slumped the way she never would. His legs jut out, the way mine do from the couch when I'm spinning a yarn of my own. I close my eyes. 
and his New England accent smells like the salt of the bay, not the same one he knew as a child, but close enough to reach across the veil of death and touch her hand. Those who don't know, I am one of those transgenders. Woo! Woo! Um, and uh, this here is my most lucrative poem yet, in that it uh, won the uh, um, Hessler contest last year. But then again, it cost me seven hundred to seven thousand two hundred dollars to write. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. Still negative. Still quite negative. This is called gender confirmation. This was not a confirmation. This was a justification. Because your brain cannot trust itself, it needs external sensory proof to tell the solid truth from lies, and it tries. It tries so hard to find some sign that it is not wrong. So I will reach out my hand and hand it a stick and say, this is my penis. I will tap on its palm and say, this is my heart. I will guide its finger across my skin saying, this is my soul, because it needs to touch something. It cannot believe in a thing that can't be touched. So it needs a name to have a sound, and it needs a man to have a name, and it needs a wound to leave a scar, and it needs a grief to be bound to a grave. I did this to my body now so that my childhood brain and all its wicked, confounded thoughts can look forward and feel justified in saying, that is me. How are we on time? Three-ish minutes. I want to do a poem that's not by me. It's by one of my favorites, Langston Hughes. It's called Let America Be America Again. I would like to dedicate this one to that dude who wants some kind of wall or something. Hey, dude! <laughs> Walls suck! Yeah. I don't like Cheetos. <laughs> Me either. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There never, there's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark, and who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery's scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and, and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfied need. 
of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer bondsman to the soil. I am the worker sold to the machine. I am the Negro servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean, hungry yet today despite the dream, beaten yet today. Oh, pioneers, I am the man who never got ahead, the poorest worker bartered through the years. Yet I'm the one who dreamt our basic dream in the old world while still a serf of kings, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even, yes, its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turned that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home, for I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lee, and torn from black Africa's strand, I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me, surely not me. The millions on relief today, the millions shot down when we strike, the millions who have nothing for our pay, for all the dreams we've dreamed, and all the songs we've sung, and all the hopes we've held, and all the flags we've hung, and millions who have nothing for our pay, except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose, the seal of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again. America! Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. Actually, if you want to, you don't want to work too hard on this. 
kick her up a crap. And like I said, besides that, it's maybe a little bit technical. Yeah. Which I should avoid projection. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. For having me. After all, got out. Thank you for being here. Appreciate the invitation. It's an honor. And I enjoyed following Cy. That was a really sweet read. Thank you. Side angle side. Used to be a line was a line. 
and you didn't cross it. Being a lion meant something in those days. If your dad was a lion, other kids looked up to you. Every now and then we'd have trouble with the angles. They called us sides in that superior tone that they use like, like their shit don't stink. But we were in the same union. Hell, my sister married an angle, so it's not that big a deal. They're okay when sober, but after a beer or two, that 90 degree attitude comes right back around. It takes three angles to make a box corner. They tell you, all wide-eyed, like they was Einstein, and you're like, duh. But the angles are okay, you know, when the new contracts come up, the flagpole, they turned out to be really good at nitpicking. We'd all joke about how the angles could read between the lines, even though there wasn't nothing written there. Grandpa was a line, and, and Pop was a line, and hell, I've been a line since 74. We're all straight arrow and true as a blue blade, but things don't look so good for the kid. Line work is drying up, and I'm not sure he'd have made it anyhow. I mean, all it does is sit in his room with his headphones on, smoking who knows what. So I says to him, you'll never be a line the way you're going. And he says, what's so great about lines anyhow? How can you talk to a kid like that? You know what he wants to be? A point. You know how many dimensions that is? None! If he knew what we did to points when I was a kid, he'd be so embarrassed. But he won't let up. He says, it's all coming from a single point, he says. Slow, like he's explaining it to an idiot. An infinite number of lines in all directions at once and now he's starting to skim because we lost the sight benefits. We lost the sight benefits in the last contract thanks to the angles falling asleep at the wheel. So many lines that they disappear. We forget that it's all just lines coming from a point and we can start and we can start to buy into this whole three-dimensional mythology. How do you like that? You slave your your life away, making reliable angles, reliable edges, nothing fancy, but edges that you can that you can count on. And then these schools teach your kid that it's a myth. Somebody has to do something to make it great again. It can't go on like this. What do they think we're going to be driving in the future? Spheres? As if. <laughs> Monarch butterflies gather in Mexico to renegotiate NAFTA. First resolution, there are no borders, only ranges for different species of milkweed, 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 mother of us all. <laughs> Second resolution, no tariffs, for drifting seed, seed in flight on silk and wing shall pass above and light on any land. Third resolution, other species of butterfly may mimic monarch color without license or limitation, but birds who peck selectively to avoid cardiac glycosides are strictly banned. Fourth resolution, Seeing as the Aztec practice of ritual butterfly sacrifice is no longer extant in the treaty region, all related regulation is hereby declared void. Fifth resolution. Given that separation from the host plant and imprisonment of first instar caterpillars is morally repugnant for all faiths and ethical systems, such practice is banned henceforth, forthwith, and in perpetuity. 
general addendum. Butterflies were free, are free, and shall be free as long as wind blows through milkweed leaves. Multitasking in the multiverse. Men have trouble multitasking, she said. At least I think it was her. I wasn't paying that close attention. So I could be wrong. But anyhow, something caused me to take a battery-powered electric razor into the garden when I went out to look for signs of uh, drought-related stress on the viburnums. I was buzzing away at my stubble and glancing up at the droopy leaves when I noticed a hummingbird hovering about 10 feet above my head. I snapped off the razor and he drifted back into a wreath of leaves. I say he because years of, of watching shaving commercials during televised baseball games leads me to believe that only a male hummingbird would get its dander up over the buzz of a Norelco. I flipped the razor back on and the bird resumed his position above. And then I flipped it off and he backed away again. Something about this filled me with anxiety. Could it be that there really is a butterfly effect and that seemingly tiny things we do have large and distant consequences that can turn on and off like one and zero on some large and invisible computer? When the already rapidly beating heart of the small creature elevates still further and the wings buzz just a little bit harder, could governments topple or small swells turn into tidal waves? Or when the razor stops, might waves of bliss head out through the Kuiper belt and on across the galaxy. If matter at the quantum level is constructed of virtual particles that pop in and out of existence, might be God, viewed here as a grizzled older gentleman only because the writer has spent too many hours watching the commercials that accompany televised sporting events. Might not God be shaving in his garden? And what strange hummingbird might he be dealing with? Or perhaps this cosmic hummingbird is God revealing herself, like Krishna to Arjuna, to some great and dim-witted constellation of shaving man. But I digress. I think my anxiety over this intermittent hovering bird has more to do with looking up, something I keep forgetting how to do as I grow older. Looking up at this beautiful apparition takes me back to a time shortly after a freak accident took my legs out from under me and put me in a wheelchair. And then in months of therapy exercises that involved lying on my back in this same garden and looking up while counting my steady breaths and leg lifts as regular as a prayer drone. It was then that I became aware that we live in the bottom of a great sea of air filled with layer upon layer of creatures and phenomena, light and shadows, visions conversing with visions, whether our eyes are open or closed. Without this little medical catastrophe, I might never have known that a layer of dragonflies swims hundreds of feet up and guards our homes as steadfastly as any Cold War submarines or that hawks and eagles patrol even higher, and above them swim the vague shapes of even more distant creatures. This ocean supports parachuting spiders as diverse as jellyfish, swarms of non-English-speaking ladybugs, and countless drifting seeds ready to repopulate the ocean trench wastelands if given half a chance. Anyhow, anyone who has ever taken flight in a dream can tell you that it's really more like swimming, frog kicking through the air to get that dreamy perspective on this great coral reef that is human culture. Is it any wonder that my Celtic ancestors saw great ships in the sky 
sailing west. Okay, but did you notice that the viburnums need water? Sorry, I forgot to check. <laughs> did you finish shaving? No, not quite, but you know, I can do it in the car on the way. <laughs> she was asking for it. Behind every shithole country is an act of colonial rape. Oh, yeah. Behind every terrorist bomb is a smiling missionary or corporate agent. Back when Africa was being gang-banged by Leopold II, Stanley and Livingston, the French Foreign Legion, Firestone, Tire and Rubber, all seven of the seven sister oil giant offspring of the Titan Atlas banging away, back when Africa was being improved, educated, modernized, tied to a bed and stripped of her diamonds, stripped of her rubber, stripped of her ivory and ebony and gold, stripped of her cobalt and uranium, stripped of her children sent to the mines for the sake of our cell phones, our tires, our necklaces and engagement rings, stripped of her languages, the oldest on earth, stripped of her boys, forced to soldier, stripped of her girls, forced to brothels. Back when Africa was being gangbanged by her own people, pitted against each other by unseen powers, market forces, commodity traders, gangbanged and forced to labor with hands cut off and other mutilations. But that all stopped, you say, in 1907, in 1912, you say, or was it 1945, or was it 1963? But but that all stopped, you say, as African children work to death even as we speak, poisoned while seeking the poisons we need. Back, way back in the dark part of the past when Africa was being gangbanged by Europe and America and China. Oh, what are we doing here this time, boys? Is it terror we fight or terror we use? She is there for the taking, and if we don't do it, Somebody else will, somebody else will, so bang away bang and haul away home. The stuffed animals, the ceremonial masks, look at the detail. Amazing what they did with such primitive tools. Not people like us, but clever in their own way, and yet their countries are shitholes. So best they stay home for the good of us all, for the good of us all, for the good of us all.
But Jesus had no papers, so they threw him in a corporate jail. See, Jesus had no papers, but they threw his ass in corporate jail. He says, what a wealthy country, and nobody's coming to pay my bail. Your left wing stop believing and your right wing thinks they own my soul. They got me in their prison and they're bragging that they own my soul. When my sacred heart goes flying, when my body's in your deep dark hole. Jesus had no papers. Jesus said no papers. Thank you. Thank you very much, RC. Yes, do you have a form again? Does General Addendum get along with Captain Obvious? Excellent. <laughs> All right. The best place to write is here. The best time to write is now. The best people to write are Us. much better. Thank you. All right. Our third performer, Eli Williams, is a writer of music, writer of words and self-proclaimed number four on the top five best petter of cats. <laughs> he believes that even though the world breaks us, we can pick up the pieces and create something even more beautiful in its place. His work reflects the building of the pieces he has found through his travels and the pieces of himself. With them, he hopes to find others that will help glue together the change that can help increase understanding, empathy, and kindness in this ever-changing world. Please welcome to the stage, Eli Williams! What up? Uh, I just realized I have to pee. Oh. Ah. So, uh, whoops. Go ahead. Okay. Cool. I'm supposed to tell everybody that the only bathroom is over there is the one marked women, so we're all using it. Alright. I think we can all oh, handle, cool. handle a gender neutral bathroom. Yes. We're all adults here. Yes. Hi. Uh, um, it is really bright up here, and I haven't done this for a while, so. We're glad you're here. Hey, thanks. I'm glad you're here. Uh, hey, my dad's here. Woo! He's like that guy over there. Um, he's the only family member that loves me enough to be here. Um, I really wish that wasn't true. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just setting you guys up for the fact that all of my poetry and music is kind of sad. Um, fantastic. That's fine. Uh, this guy, holy crap, so good. Sky, amazing. Uh, I love banjos. Uh, anyway, all right, enough stalling. Um, so I'm gonna start with a song that I don't think is finished. Uh, and it might be awful, but we're gonna do it. Somehow I have to get this pick. Once I stop. We can do this together. All right, I think I think we'll be good. I might just not do that. Okay. Uh, all right. <laughs>
Thank you. takes pictures of flowers, digital snapshots of vivid memories. She changes with the season, seems to flow with the breeze. She's an apathetic queen driven by misery she's only seen. She won't let anyone in. Must be too damp or corroded or too cramped for her style. She's used to being used and sadness is just another word. Alone is not a description, it's just an existence. It's not my fault you don't feel the love I give. You don't have to do this alone, and you never have, but you get what you give. I've watched you walk away too many times to care about the broken bones for holding yourself too tight. You survived and keep surviving, and all you care about is survival. I care about caring, hug hugging ghostly corpses, and trying to find you in crowded bars, looking at the back of heads in dim light. I'm starting to choke on the thick puffs. I'm starting to think none of this was ever worth it. Whoa. Uh, more happy family stuff, that one's about my mother. Uh, okay. Uh, this is titled, uh, We Don't Know Why. As long as I don't breathe, I won't see you. Sometimes love isn't enough and we don't know why. But everything happens for a reason and even if that's not the case, we have to believe it. It's the only thing we can believe when the loneliness sets in. And you can't drink anymore because your world is blurred and your breathing is shallowed, and the walls start moving, and you close your eyes, and the tears they burn, and the nails dig deeper, and you clench your jaw, and your noises muffle, and you sleep. But you never want to, because you always wake up. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> okay. This is called Red Lights. Um, I wrote this poem <laughs> while at a red light. Hey, props to awesome titles. <clears throat> yeah. Red lights. I can't seem to make my heartbeat slow down. This is around the time where everything gets messy, and I can't catch up on my fuck ups, and I keep saying sorry, but it's starting to not matter. I stop at red lights for a little too long, staring out my window looking at people going wherever they are going. I'm drawn to know if they are happy, and how I could be too. If I could be too. If I could just go where they're going, see what their life is like, maybe all my fuck-ups would be put into perspective. Maybe it would make me a better writer. Maybe I could find out what I've been missing. Or maybe it would just make the driver behind me really, really pissed off. <laughs> so, you guys ever had one of those exes that make you hate, like, everything? Yes. No. yes. I'm sorry to whoever hasn't. Uh, your life is disgusting and gross. Um, so I have, and uh, she's the worst. I hope you're watching. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, I have a really funny story about this. Uh, I literally wrote this, and I had no idea that she was still following my poetry blog. And I got a text that said, hey, said, hey, what poems are about me? <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> like, uh, a lot of them? But what about this one? Oh. You found who this. Fuck yeah, it's about you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is called Closets and Corridors. You are a broken poem. You are the words I have to claw out of my skin. Finding anything with a sharp point just to be disappointed again that all I can find are the couple of spoons you left me with. And each layer has a different story to tell about why you left. 
You are the shitty poem I can't stop writing. You're the puzzle we did the first week we moved into our new place. You taught me how to glue every piece together. You gave it a purpose other than shoving it back into the box, broken. You are what love dreams about when it's having a nightmare. The overused, complicated cliche of being too, too loved to stay. And love is chasing you down corridors while you are alone, hiding, broken, in a closet waiting for someone to try and pull you out while you pull them in. I think I'm just going to read through all my poetry, and then if I have time, I'll play that one song that I royally messed up at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> okay, this is called Drawing Lines. And now we're getting into the, like, shorter poetry thing, because when I was in college, I thought that that was cool. Um, and so I have a ridiculous amount of poems that are really, really short. Uh, this is called Drawing Lines. Drawing lines down your forearms to your palms, Tracing the track marks with flesh-colored crayon. Let's pretend we can just close our eyes to this forever. Uh, <clears throat> this is called, uh, Disjointed. I find myself at this altar again, saving up my tears for a sacrifice, and I ask the gods to let me be free of the aching bones and heavy heart, the thick blood that runs slowly through me. I ask them, ripping my clothes to shreds, if I have suffered enough yet, screaming if they are happy that they keep giving and taking my will to live with each person they place and pull out of my life. With each piece of string left, I fashion a rope to pull myself out of this dirt pit that was dug for me long before I was ever born. I'm sick of the dirt piled underneath my fingernails. I'm sick of being stuck working so hard to gain so little. I scream and the gods have no answers. They lead me to myself again. I'm no good on my own, and I am no good to no one. I entangle the rope, and I place the strings on the ground, so I don't strangle myself while weeding. <clears throat> this might be one of my favorite poems ever, and I'm really hyping it up, uh, because it's really, really short. It's called Drunken Epiphanies One. <clears throat> I can't, I gotta, I gotta get into it. <clears throat> Life is a colony of fireflies encased in a mason jar that you forgot to poke holes in. Oh, yes. I was really, really drunk. <laughs> uh, now we're going back to sad. I'm sorry. Uh, this is entitled Come Crash Down Around Me. Uh, if it helps, I generally don't talk about my poetry and what I wrote it about, or when, or how, or whatever, because a lot of them I write while driving, and that's probably oh. illegal. <laughs> um, so, when Trump first got elected, they had all of those, I know, it's the worst. Uh, when Trump first got elected, they were having all of those um, riots in the streets in New York around Trump Tower. I, I wrote this poem, um, and here we are two years later, after they said that they were going to try and impeach him, 100 days, 100 and some odd days uh, into office. Um, but I wrote this poem then, uh, and I'm an incredibly pessimistic person. Uh, so, okay, so here we go. <laughs> Everything all at once has come crashing down around me. I hear the trumpets roar and the tussled strands of hair. Underneath my furrowed brow, I can see it now as the thousands cry out. We are told to fight for peace and equality. It's just not what it's meant to be. And we, we are not what we are meant to be. There's so much more out there, somewhere, and a child's embrace or a 25-something's naivety that all of this will work out in the end. Everything all at once is coming together, trembling together. We once stood weathered and torn but alive. Everything all at once has changed, and I'm not so sure it meant anything. Okay, now we're getting into some of my favorite ones. Um, Alright, <clears throat> this is called Losing God. I've tried to find God in the dim light of grungy bars, in the limelight of stars, backwoods in a stranger's garage. Half faces made out by the light of the inhalation of cigarettes, 
Sitting in broken rocking chairs placed in a half-built shack, the rush of a blackened river bouncing off leafless trees, echoes of half-hearted laughter from people who no longer have life to give unless it's given from a bottle. Self-sufficient, self-suffocating, self-sacrifice is found in our vice, the thing we choose to make us feel alive. But what is left of life if we haven't lived to have anything to lose? Uh, okay, so these three poems are literally my last relationship. <clears throat> body sings electric. My body was electric and the stars were lightning bugs swirling in a glass jar just open. My mind was silent and your smile became all that I have ever loved, I have ever needed. And as the music danced with my soul, I felt whole. So next one is called Tattoo. I want you to tattoo the word love across my heart so the sacrifice of pain means something. So when you open me whole on the days I don't feel anything at all, you can put me in front of the mirror so I can remember, so I can see that love is a part of me. And uh, this last one is Young Love. And I actually have these differently on this piece of paper, but now that I'm saying them, I think I'm always going to do them this way. Um, yeah, so this next one is called Young Love. She pressed her lips to my chest, told me I was her best yet. Told me she wasn't waiting around for me to pretend that I was what she needed. Then she left. Uh, this is called You Are. Um, thank you. You are constant in waiting. And love when I come home. You sit and just stare right at me, right through me. You sleep and somehow drown out everything, yet conscious when I call your name. You understand so much, but I can never tell what you comprehend. You inhale warmth and cuddle up when it's cool. You are everything I want in a person. You are the best cat in the world. Uh, oh, okay. yeah. So gross. Uh, it was perfect. <clears throat> Perfect. Uh, uh, this one is called Worth, and I left this one for last. I actually have music that goes with this, but it is really hard to play your guitar and say poetry. So I'm just going to do it without music, and to the same cadence that I would do it. I think that makes sense. <laughs> And this is probably, like, Ryan's eighth time of hearing this poem, so just bear with me, friend. Eh, it doesn't make it any less better. Yeah. That's true. Okay. <clears throat> and let's see if I can get this right. I've been stuck so long in a mindset that didn't fit. The oversized circle shape to my square self. Worthless. Useless. Better off dead. Afraid of my potential, afraid of becoming anything more than what I already was, fighting so hard for love that didn't see the potential of who I was. I let myself believe I didn't deserve to be better, that living life was the suffering I needed to endure because of my failings and mistakes. Like I was something special enough to die a martyr to the causes I made up in my own head. Night-long battles of hoping I could finally pull the trigger on the gun I hid in a backpack kept in the back of the closet. Secrets slowly being pulled out. Like all the knives we put back into the drawers, one at a time over the course of a month because I was getting better. But mainly, I was just better at hiding. Everything slowly started to unwind into I don't know answers, but I was still trying. I understand now so much more than what I did. And every person in my life until this point was bullets in a chamber. I guess I just needed someone to pull the trigger. I needed to be shot in the head. I can feel the vulnerability like the rush of blood on a cold day. The pounding in my head pushes me to continue. And the old selfish desire that maybe if I keep trying, I'll be good enough again for you to love. I can end now.
Thank you so much. I'm going to go pee. Let's give it up again for Eli. Fantastic and multiple ways of performing. Okay, the best place to write is? Here. The best time to write is? Now. And the best people to write? Us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, our fourth and final feature of this evening. Kristen recently graduated from college with two degrees in English and writing. Does that mean writing in languages other than English? Now she works in the children's department of her hometown library. Her poetry has been published by Writing Nights Press and Moonchild Magazine. Please give it up for Kristen Marshall! should only burn our lungs after the funeral. And until then, we can satisfy our hunger with the tension building along our jaw lines. The taste reminds me of the first Thanksgiving Grammy spent in the nursing home. Mom burnt the turkey and black chars clung to my gums. When I talk about filling the knots of my lips with Grammy's scolding words, her rouge-colored lipstick, Mom presses her whole hand to her mouth orders me to scrub that shit from my lips with a bar of soap and forgiveness from the Lord. Half mercy, half... You should have known better. And while I'm at it, scrub the words heaven and desire and sanity from the creases in my mind where Grammy's dementia will fit me so perfectly. The red blood cells delivering oxygen to my lungs mingle with some measure of Grammy's blood and her great aunt Martha's blood and the blood of the Dutch girl who crossed the Atlantic. And that's all we know about her. She crossed this great mass of water because here we all are on her land drowning. We carry her genetics and let them weigh down our bones, watch our children sink closer to the ground with each tree branch they inherit. But even if the wind scrubbed clean the initials carved in the wood, there would still be the roots, like graves sprouting from the soil. They look like my mother's tangled hair, the tumor in her liver. There are families of birds nesting in my lungs. Sometimes, when I gasp for air, I can hear them singing for help. When I open my mouth to let them speak, I taste salt water and the residue of Grammy's Rouge on my lips. Thank you. Um, so this next one is called The Ghosts of Nimishillan County. I grew up with the corn stalks settled into the soil of haunted farmhouses, curled around the jagged circles of potholes left by my great granddaddy's six cylinder Fiat 527. Oh. They tell me his ghost still roams these fields, and when I look into great Grammy's milky eyes, which do not know mine, I swear he's in there, coiled around her irises. My next door neighbor was a pump jack its giant metal arm rising up and down, extracting oil, facing southwest towards the forest behind the elementary school, where Jessica found the skeleton of a deer during recess. We crowded around the carcass of this small deity, praying to its spirit in seances. We could imagine the deer as a little god protecting a world inside his skull, now buried above his ancestors, the fossils that propel our lives forward. And how could we not believe in ghosts? Amanda hears her granddad's cough in her mother's lungs, a golden camel perched on a cardboard box, the same way she feels her father's rage stomping through her veins, even as her mother puts her whole hand to her mouth and asks, who taught Amanda to say such foul language in polite company? Ugh. We grew into the words we didn't know 
into the crooked noses of our parents, Hunter into his older brother's Marlboro cigarettes, then into Red Man's chewing tobacco. But when Hunter's dad caught him with the peace nuzzle so comfortably between his lower lip and gum, the old man made him drink the water bottle of dip and spit until he threw up along the road. And on the bus the next day, we all pointed to the spot on the sidewalk where his vomit had seeped between the cracks, had lingered. We said, there, that's where it happened, right there. This whole town was a lesson on lingering, on shrinking, on being swallowed whole. Jake watched his mother's lips grow thinner in the church's wooden pews and in the passenger seat of his daddy's eight-cylinder F-150 and at the dinner table until one night her tongue fell like a piece of veal into the mashed potatoes. Everyone said she cried and cried and boxed up her Grammy's framed picture, her best pair of fork boots, and poof, just like that, Jake's mom disappeared. This was not our first taste of illusion. We'd seen magic the way Alyssa smacked a home run on the exact moment a bolt of lightning cracked onto the field. The way our grandfather's skin changed to leather right before our eyes, added splotches of moles, irregular edges. The calluses never faded, only the flush of red under the skin. They held marbles between their teeth, passing down the recycled clouds of tobacco that clung to the fabric of our Little League t-shirts. We spent our whole lives trying to blow it out of our bodies, but we can't seem to shake the smoke from our veins any better than the feel of two hooked fingers inside the eye sockets of our dear skull and the weight of carrying it home with us. By the time we figured out that quarters could be spent on better things than soda from the vending machine outside the country corner mini mart, that a bus pass could take you further than the edges of our town map, we had already memorized the lines around our mother's eyes, our faces and mirrors that have started to look the same. The back roads, the veins of this place, memorizing the look of dirt caked into our knuckles. We could never scrape this town from under our fingernails. Even in the years after we evacuated, there was always Nimishillen County nestled into our fingerprints, our calluses, making ghosts out of all of us. Thank you. on my mother's liver, and uh, a lot of people don't know that, or a lot of people do know, I guess, now, that my mom passed away about a year ago, and so um, this next poem I wrote, and it's about her, and it was interesting, because I couldn't quite finish it, and I was struggling with it, and then we got the news that, um, that her cancer was terminal, and then I was able to finish it. Um, so this one's for her, and it's called Thunderstorm in a Bottle. Be no bar. Thunderstorm in a Bottle. A storm is pulling the waves up over my head. My whole body flips over. The sand scrapes my knees and salt fills the craters of my cheeks where the words used to be. My mother is waiting by the shore with a clean towel held open and eyes weighed down by worry. Those wrinkles are strained bridges connecting her eyes to her brows. I know the look well. Right after I was born, lifted from the sea of mommy's belly, my lung collapsed or filled with water, maybe when we separated I took too much of her with me. My whole being formed around years of words she ushered to the back of her mind, fell to the pit of her stomach. Of course I couldn't hold the weight. If you curled me up I was no bigger than her heart. I hear her heart beating as I struggle to shore. The storm rolls closer and sand scatters in the wind. I can't see her, but when I pull back the curtain of quartz and field spar, I see the daisies from her garden. The time I plucked them from the soil, roots still dangling from the tip. I collected two handfuls, tied them together with a scrunchie, and held them up to her. Showed her how much I loved my mom. She smiled with sealed lips didn't have the heart to tell me what I did wrong. When I opened my mouth to squeal, sand grinds up my gums, lodges between my teeth, salt water clogs my throat. Mom once told me to swim parallel to shore if I get pulled out to sea. She said it in the pocket of air that burst from her lungs the time Dad's fist turned metal frying pan. 
He threw kitchenware grenades, but her shrieks were the timely explosions. I can't hear them now. The water is filling my ears. I open my mouth and see bubbles float to the surface. There, I have my words. And somewhere in the enveloping ocean are messages corked into bottles that belong to my mom. Lightning cracks, and I know the storm is fermented enough for a burning taste. One of my four brothers told me my mom cried tears of joy when I was born. Her drops of salt water rest on my tongue. They taste like her laugh and sound like my voice. Thank you. So, I also have this habit of writing uh, sad poetry, as you can tell. <laughs> um, but I've been trying to experiment and write poems that are meant to be performed and maybe with a more a funnier tone. So this poem is about this super sweet, great guy uh, who hit on me at a laundromat and I was an asshole and ghosted. Um, so instead of going on the date, I just wrote a poem about it. Oh. <laughs> and, and, my bad. Um, there's no title, but it's, you know, here. <laughs> okay. Maybe you noticed me when I poured liquid laundry detergent into the commercial standard Speed Queen front-loading washer. Maybe you were smitten when I fumbled around my coat pocket looking for quarters before I remembered I stuck them in my winter hat. Or maybe you found it sincere that I'm washing my roommate's clothes because I mean all four baskets of laundry can't possibly be mine. They are. They are all mine. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, you've noticed me and tell me about a cheaper washer meant for smaller loads. I pump five dollars worth of quarters into the machine while you explain the different sizes of commercial washers. And I'm thankful for the dollar saved. Residue of detergent lurks on the floor. I step in the slime and track it across the tile to the dryers. We exchange stories and I appreciate how you leave me alone at first, drifting through the people, never lingering too long. Eventually, you feel comfortable enough to ask if I ever get into the illegal stuff. <laughs> First explaining how you enjoyed harder days of acid, sometimes coke, but you mostly smoke weed now. <laughs> so I tell you about the second time, time I dropped LSD, not because I'm particularly proud of this event, but you've watched me pull my panties for almost 20 minutes now, and I feel like we've reached a point of intimacy. <laughs> I tell you how I rode in the back of a Sebring convertible and how the acid turned the wind into a time warp and I swore I could collapse my hand around stars if only I could reach. A laundry mat is not a romantic place, nor is it a good spot to search for metaphors or similes, but when I mention my dead mom and my evacuation to Akron, you don't flinch. Instead, you laugh and ask, what's so special about this city? I laugh too. Nothing, I say, absolutely nothing. You help me carry my now clean wardrobe out to the car. When you ask for my number, your eyes are on the ground. I scribble ten digits onto a sheet of paper just as the time warp loses itself to the wind. If only I saw myself as more than a distant gleam. If only you could reach far enough to collapse your hand around mine. Thank you. really bad at those. Um, so for now, I'm just calling it downtown. A map of downtown Canton is pressed into my heart. All God's children on Tusk knew me in my poopy diaper years. And some days, in the summer, my daycare teacher would walk me and God's other children up 2nd Street to the picnic tables on Market. We'd have brown bag lunches, and I thought it was weird that downtown smelled so much like ham and cheese sandwiches. Uh, uh, uh. Mom worked at Stark County Job and Family Services, case manager. She'd pick me up from daycare every day at 4.06 exactly. On the way home, we passed this park, thick with oaks. And when autumn sighed its crisp breath through these streets, those trees turned sunset. And my mom just exhaled with the wind, said, look, sweetie, look at how those leaves change. Look how beautiful they are just before they fall. Mom did not die like the leaves. The winter, her cancer turned terminal. She shriveled like the skeleton of a park buried under snow. And this is not a metaphor. 
Her body is where I learned to climb. Her shoulders were the top of the highest slide I always peered over, but was too afraid to travel alone. These days, my body feels more like an empty house, or our living room after the funeral home collected my mom, but before a hospice came for the hospital bed suspended, forever scrubbing the piss stain on the living room rug left for mom's catheter, winter sighing a bitter breath. Spring betrayed me. Storefronts in downtown Canton scrape ice from their windows and promise rebirth. Ghosts don't die, and resurrection is for weeds stuck between sidewalk cracks, not for the people who yank out the roots. There is an empty desk at Stark County Job and Family Services where my mom used to sit. The cork board walls still punctured from thumbtacks, holding my second grade school picture or a drawing from my freshman art class. This is how grief reminds us and echoes. If you pick at Canton's roads long enough, red bricks from times of Nash Ramblers will appear. The pavement of Mazda's nestled into its past. The way downtown Canton still smells like ham and cheese sandwiches. The way autumn sighs its crisp breath again and again, transforming and falling again and again and again. Thank you. Do we have time for one more, perhaps? Yeah. Sure. Sure? Okay. Uh, this one's called Needlefish. The pipe under your kitchen sink burst. Water mixed with your mom's stuffing and residue of baklava unhinged the PVC towers, an alligator opening its jaw tooth by tooth. Your head dipped back onto your neck and you lapped in the sprinkler soaking your khakis. Your uncle came and assessed the damage. When he pulled the brass roots from the sink, he handed me the curved trap and from it fell your mom's engagement ring she lost four years ago. You said she had forgotten all about it, but when I held it out in my palm, she cried and gripped my wrist, her unburied treasure. We spent half a summer and most of my paychecks from the grocery store at the Commons Community Pool. We made out in the tongue slide of the playground built for all the kids too afraid of the water. I never liked wearing a bathing suit around you anyway. You pinch the rolls gathering at my stomach and say, my mom was skinny once too. My thighs prickled red against the cement when I kicked my legs in the shallow water. I kept your beach towel over my lap as you swam to the deep end. My fingers ran through the marks stretched out like rivers along my hips. On the way home, I asked you about the girl in the red suit, the one who can do a backflip off the highest diving board. When she broke the surface again, you reached for her hand and pulled her to the ladder. You bought her a Pepsi from the concession stand. The edges of your smile lifted red cheeks. You said I should be honored. I'm the girl who memorizes his grandma's favorite fried chicken recipe. She's the girl with the monthly subscription to the tanning salon. Her beauty washes off in the shower, but I can't brush your bruises from my skin for weeks. I try to talk about how hard it is for a scathing heat to battle an entire ocean of chlorine, a perfect pH balance, but you beg me to forget all about her. I learned to swim in that water we pushed under the bridge. Brown sewage pumped out of the culvert, a steady stream, a murky surface budding past my ears until all I knew to do was survive. My lungs sprouted gills, but every bone holding me together snapped like coral, like your uncle's fishing line. That time a female needlefish flung herself from the water, latched on with the razors, razors in her mouth. His arms made of rubber flailed. I thought the snap was a shotgun in the distance, but between his calloused fingers that looked like yours rested a frayed line. Your uncle cursed at the sky, yelled about how good her flesh would have tasted fried. You sat with the empty cooler on your lap. When your bone-dry stare met mine, I realized you probably liked me served the same way. The pole fell stiff in my hands. We drove home in silence. I will find the needlefish you could not conquer. I will swim with her. Thank you.
Thank you, Kristen. Give her another round of applause, which is awesome. Kristen is one of the competitors at Astaloo. Um, so for those of you who may not be aware, on February 23rd, we're going to have the Astaloo Sword Fight Tournament. Uh, it was supposed to be last Saturday, but due to weather and people dropping out, uh, we have moved it to February 23rd. So that will be in downtown Canton. And one thing I did not mention earlier is that there will be door prizes of actual cash. So you, for your five dollar admission, you might walk away with, with fifty dollars. You never know. Actual money. So everybody loves cash. Everybody loves cash. Okay. Uh, also, for those of you who are watching on Facebook Live, in the description there should be a link to the PayPal so that you can donate as well because of all these fantastic four performers that we saw here this evening. So please give all the performers, so for this evening, a round of applause. All right, for the recorded open mic, the first person I have on the list is Daria Quinn. Please give it up for Daria! here are from Canton. Okay, this, uh, this is a bit Canton-centric. So. Um, I've actually been allowing myself to reacquaint myself with the spoken word career of Joel Biafra. And Woo! I'm glad I'm not the only one who knew that what that was. Um, but, uh, you know, after listening to a guy uh, share poems about uh, sticking an American flag up George H.W. Bush's ass and lighting him on fire, I figure there's absolutely nothing I can say that would be more ridiculous. So, this, uh, this is uh, if a certain orange bastard became the mayor of Canton, Ohio. <clears throat> Greetings, Canton, Ohio. Now that I've been sworn in, sworn in as your new mayor, I want to talk to you today about how we can make Canton, Ohio great again. I have a plan. It's a great plan. You're, you're going to love this plan. Believe me, it's the greatest plan you'll ever hear. And th this is my plan to make Canton, Ohio great again. First, we're going to start by building a wall. Yeah, that's right. We're going to build a wall around the El Campesino Mexican restaurant on Cleveland Avenue. We're going to build a wall to keep all the delicious, authentic Mexican food from crossing our border. We, we must protect Taco Bell and their authentically American tacos from being replaced by Mexican ones. We must, put, we must also protect Chipotle, uh, their Chisora burritos. They're, they're absolutely wonderful. They make the best burritos. You should buy some. They're very delicious, believe me. We cannot allow Chipotle to be replaced by authentic Mexican food. America is the only country that knows how to make good tacos and good burritos. And Canton, Ohio is going to support American tacos and American burritos by building a wall around the El Campesino restaurant on Cleveland Avenue and making the El Campesinos pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we're going to kill all the black people. Wait, wait, wait. What? We're not going to kill all the black people? Oh, well, we are. We're just not supposed to say it. Well, what am I supposed to say then? Okay, we're not going to kill all the black people. Believe, believe me, I love black people. I love their hair, I love their music, I have black friends. O.J. Simpson, great man, great man. Totally didn't kill Nicole. Kanye West, personal friend of mine. I I'm fairly sure one of my ex-wives was black. I can't remember her name right now. I'm pretty sure I was married to a black woman for a while, I think. And maybe she was just really tan. Anyway, I want to assure you that I'm totally not racist. I don't want to kill black people. I like black people. Black people are some of the greatest people I know. We're totally not going to kill all the black people, I swear. <laughs> what we're really going to do is rebuild our police department. We're going to get rid of the old police department completely, and we're going to replace it with newer, better policemen. We're looking for strong, young, heterosexual white men, men with actual penises, and I'm not going to realize I'm going to be pregnant. We're looking for good, strong, straight white men, preferably with anger management issues. 
then we're going to pass a new law that's giving police the power to shoot anyone on site for any reason. They don't actually have to be breaking the law or resisting arrest. All they need to do is be within shooting range of a police officer. We'll also institute very strict gun regulations on who, and who, who is and is not allowed to own a gun in the city of Canton, Ohio, assuring that only responsible gun owners are legally allowed to own guns. And when we say responsible gun owners, I mean white people. <clears throat> then we're going to put in place a travel ban on anyone from Maslin. <laughs> For, for too long now, Massimo Tigers fans have been invading our city, taunting our football players. They're disrespectful. They're dangerous. The Tigers are losers. They're, they're not very good. They're all a bunch of rapists and drug dealers. And I have it on good authority that they also have bed bugs too. Our Bulldogs, they're a great football team. They're the best as far as football goes. The Tigers, they're fake. They're a fake football team. They play fake football. There's no place for fake football here in Canton, Ohio. Go Bulldogs! All, right. <laughs> All citizens of Canton, Ohio will be required to follow me on Twitter. So you can stay up to date on the new policies I hope to enact as your new mayor. Anyone found unfollowing me on Twitter will be arrested and charged with treason. All citizens are also required to like my page on Facebook and follow me on Instagram. Any citizen found trolling my social media accounts will be arrested and prosecuted. All women between the ages of 17 and 30 must accept random dick pics from myself or any other member of your city government. Any woman who receives a dick pic from a public official will be required to send at least three high quality nude photos of themselves within 24 hours. These nudes must show at least one of three areas Required areas completely exposed. Those being, of course, the breasts, the buttocks, and the genitals. Failure to respond with three acceptable high-quality news within the 24-hour period will be prosecuted. Now, once we have all of these policies in place, I assure you, no, no, I guarantee you that we will make Canton, Ohio great again. Yeah. Daria. Now I know why taco trucks exist so they can go around the wall. <laughs> All right, I believe RC has a quick announcement before we go on to our next open mic performer. I always forget this stuff when I'm reading poetry. But anyhow, I wanted to mention two things real quickly. For the last uh, two years, and, and in this June, we do a reading at the Wick Poetry Center in uh, Kent uh, with an environmental theme. We did Lake Erie last year and uh, the Cauga River two years ago, and we're coming back to the Cauga River this year because it's the 50th anniversary of the Burning River. So if you've got any Burning River poems, Give me your email or uh, talk to me before you leave. Um, we usually put together about 25 or 30 poets. We produce a book out of the reading, and it, it's a pretty cool event. So I wanted to tell you about that. Also, there's a reading in downtown Kent every month. It's at the Last Exit Bookstore. The next one is February 22nd. Thank you very much for your patience. Go on with the reading. I have a kind of a river poem. It's actually a haiku. And most of you have already heard it. <laughs> hey, Pittsburgh, it's Cleveland. I see your three rivers, and I raise you a burning one. <laughs> Thank you. All right. No, I'm, I'm not planning on leaving. I'm just cold. And our next performer to the mic is Ryan Kinney. Put this thing slightly closer to Leprechaun, right? Hi, I'm Ryan. Hi, Hi Ryan. Hey. Hey, uh, I also run a uh, writing group called Beautiful Blasphemy. We make Woo. free little books like this, Yay. and there's a whole pile of them back there. Feel free Woo. to steal whatever you want. Free stuff! Yay, Woo. stuff! Free shit! 
And I also like to thank them because I never did publicly. They also donated a bunch of books to our Words to the Wise program, where we gave a bunch of local writers books to libraries in Northeast Ohio. Yay. We wound up with over 150 books, which is why we started making books for poets, because holy shit, guys. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is called The Moment. The Japanese girl sits quietly on the pier, gazing out over the water. Her silence and knowing glance is more than either of our languages could ever comprehend. She's beautiful in her hopelessness, and I, dumbstruck in all the peace I will never know. She sits behind me squawking with an adolescent banter that must seem dire. Her intensity of voice speaks the same thing I have secretly wished for years but been too afraid to say. Please, pay attention to me. Speak I did for the very first time. This awkward message of youthful adoration is not exactly communicated articulately. Her only response is, God, I hate you. Please shut up. If I am already taking risks in my life, then I will not be silenced. For once, I will not back down. You love me. You just don't know it yet. We are inexplicably set on the very edge of the river, the smell of Texas barbecue intensifying our hunger. Half of our small group is exhausted, proving their technical prowess. While I declare that this most manly of feasts must be a competition to prove our testosterone, why simply dine in San Antonio when you can challenge your friends to a banquet of sauce-laden meats? I declare that he who finishes last or least must surrender his manhood. The balls are on the table tonight. I awoke early this morning and slipped quietly out of my bunk. My compatriots were sleeping off, still sleeping off a hangover. I push open the door hundreds of years my senior and witness the burgundy sunset of French wine country. Just think, right now, I could be mindlessly staring at rolling machinery. I place another valve on the pump and whirr, hypnotically tighten it down. The sound has become a meditation now. The zen is broken and my radio squeals. The producer has just jumped on the air. The World Trade Center is on fire. I place my wrench slowly down on the table, confused. We all do. We all are. In a half hour, we'll be all sitting around a table, listening to Howard Stern speculate on a horror. We are blinded to the true terror, what this really means, until hours later. Snow continues to flood my windshield as I wind precariously around the bespeckled Alleghenies. The city below, shrouded in the early winter light, looks as though the heavens have finally released the weight of the stars to the ground. As I marvel with this, a twinge of fear arises. I may not find shelter tonight. Nonetheless, the road levels out and an exit is offered as salvation. In the midst of planned itineraries, sightseeing, and tourist attractions, I had lost track of time. I am resigned to sleep the night in a Walmart parking lot. When I pull off the exit, however, I am pleased to see the welcoming glow of a mall. There, I discover an establishment long since lost to the ether of my youth. As I sit there, eating the 10,000 calorie hot dog, I ponder. This is what life was like when it was simpler, when I thought I knew what it was all about. Before, I was proven horribly wrong. In the midst of the audacious and elaborate splendor of Florence, I see a sight so simple, and yet so much more a monument to man's unfathomable capacity for love and compassion. A rose, brown and dead, is stuck in a chain link fence. Attached to it is a small handwritten note that reads, Kiss her now. I am in her arms, having been told no, and resigned to rejection so many times, so many times I have told myself this would never happen. As my lips touch hers, I laugh inside my head. Is this really happening? This is really happening. I hold my breath. I can see him through the window, as I have seen him through the electronic window of my TV for years. As I get closer, this feels less and less real. This is my hero, my god. He has accomplished amazing things and pushed the limits of the human body. Suddenly, I am in front of him. He looks him up and smiles as he says hello. All the nervousness, the anxiety disappears. When I realize that my God is a man, a man like me, I am terrified. Before me is a discolored, screaming, clawing, misshapen alien creature. My son takes his first breaths of real air. We are all exhausted. His mother looks at me with a look that practically screams, We did it. I plead, but we're not done doing it yet, are we? His gurgles turn into cries, and I know, I know that this, this is the moment that matters more than any in my life. I will never have a single instant matter any more than this ever will. And while I stare into his bed, I hope he proves me wrong. Ooh. 
Oh, it's kind of hard to figure out where the end of that is, huh? Every like stanza is another ending. All that's real, by the way. Every single bit of that is something that's actually happened. All right, I got a shorter one for you, and uh, it's my only attempt ever at anything lyrical. This was inspired by uh, Mama Ola Deji or uh, Vicky Aqua. Some of you might know her in Cleveland. This is Save Us From Ourselves. God save the queen, long live the king. Hail to the chief, the lord of all lies. I dredge the swamp with the bombs bursting in air. Oh, say can you see that justice is blind, that we are all colorblind, when all you can see is the white hot dawn's early light, that night means right, always fight with the sun at your back, and the darkness in your soul, but don't be black. That's worth the bullets whizzing past. A soldier's job is never done, never won. A draft dodger's never run, never won with the multiplicity of our multi-ethnicity of a nation of fools. If he lets a derelict jester who taunts our puppet strings strike the chords of the lamentations of our hearts, heartless bastards, we are no longer whole, just a sinking hole, a pit of despair that looks back at us. Look up, look down, stay down, lock down, look out. Here it comes, as above, so below. The devil's in the details that are reduced to black and whites. We are weapons of mass confusion taking aim, hiding behind his wall, to build a nation of prisoners, too afraid to yell at our battle calls, to seek retribution for our disillusion, to clear up the noise pollution, and fall on our knees to take a knee, because we need. We are a world of truth benders, rule breakers, criminal instigators, unforeseen fornicators, ego masturbators, serial verbal defecators. We are nothing, no one, nowhere, just present. At this moment in history, when we realize we fucked up, Hindsight was blindsided, blinded by the light, speckled with red, white, and bruises, masks of shame. That we were complicit in our own downfall, the fall of man, the blood is on our hands. Because we did not stop when we knew we could. Because we thought no meant yes, and that she didn't really mean it. And boys will be boys with their unruly, lethal toys that cuts through what was right and left us divided. Wow. Well, I got for you today, not three books. Thank you, Ryan. Give it up for free stuff and for Ryan. We should also definitely thank the Outpost for having us here. Because they've been awesome. And definitely make sure that you visit the bar and, and buy stuff. Not to go, but you know. Our next performer to the stage is Tom. Give it up for Tom! Can I get a Jameson to go? Do you have to my coffin? Thank you for letting me use your You're welcome. Blood mixes with the mud. 
mud and the precious stones, that's why they die. Shiny, shiny. Check it again. All oh, that I've learned and so many already have. If I told you you would believe what's wrapped around your finger If I said the ones that bled just might remind you of your family This world's not wide enough to outrun these lies, to outrun these horrors Bloods around your neck and on your hands and you hold them out proud for everyone to see Not the poor, not rock, not sleep. Certainly not them bling bling rappers. Certainly not folks just like you and me. If we only had the time, we'd mince our words till they chop down to nothing. Flip the channel and cruise on by. Shiny, shiny. Wish I could forget all that I've learned and so many already. Thank you very much, Mom. Give it up again. All right, our next performer for the recorded open mic is Stephen Daniel. my first like open mic type of arm stuff so I don't, yeah I don't really have much to say so I'm just kind of getting into it. Uh, I have like three songs I want to do. But <clears throat> You're a thorn in my side, a fucking prick, I'll break limbs to make these words fucking stick. I'm in need of a doctor, I'm just too sick and I'm only getting ill with time. You can't deny my ability to rhyme Fronting like if someone should be a crime Locking you up and throwing away the key Now let me indulge in a bit of hypocrisy As I'm grinding with the three of me Rapping like a deity, I'm supreme Living out my dream, becoming the cream of the crop And I won't stop until I reach the top Top notch everything, at words to heed I'm a dying breed, I mean these words of mine live forever too clever with every endeavor Too gallant with this talent Now I got a new melody or rather rhythm I'll be killing like a villain with my eyes to the ceiling The sky's the limit while I'll be shooting for the stars Way past Mars out of the world bars If I said it then I mean it There's no eight in between it In between lines see poetic justice Bust when I caught my sound Cause it's a profound Making something out of nothing's amount to more I dealt with the door But only one of me and something even sharp I can wait much more to the props that I feel I deserve I need to slow down, I'm sorry <laughs> Right. One in the curve, yet I swear. The girls acting up, the girls acting tough, they chose the wrong one to cuff. The bitch off the leash and let her roam. If she really loves you, then she find a way home. Hear it in my tone that I'm very serious. No, I'm not being very delirious. A bitch is a bitch, and a woman's a woman. Off enough to go hand in hand, though, bitch. You can invest in a candle for a bitch and never be a hopeless romantic. I will not deal with not even one of your antics. And now I'm the dick because I'm speaking facts. I see the truth attracts. Stop with the axe before you get the axe in these curtains. Don't let it spray. I'm not talking about cologne. I have to do this all on my own. Though I reached out for help, it wasn't well received. If you want it, you gotta go and get it. It's what I've always believed. Alright. Alright. Uh, that song was called, uh, uh, Upon the world. Uh, this next one's called uh, Saint N. So it's uh, Saint and then N. Alright. 
<clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little nervous. <clears throat> I despise all lies, I admit it's cut ties, and my eyes you were like an angel in disguise. Oh my, this is great, this must be fate, at least it's my thoughts until of late. But now I see we broke apart for a reason, it's the changing of a season. New things come, old things go, just like me in this new gummy flow. Whoa, back to these raps, I've been reading all gaps. It's like I'm typing in all caps Just to get my point across, forgive me if I start a plus But man, I'm a boss, man, I'm a boss I own this every time, all I have is sublime I'm on my grind, I'm on my grind And I continue to do work as if I had to feed A family of eleven, killing all these rappers And I send them all to heaven as I give them hell Out of a cell, into a pod, into your iPod Me, oh my, I'm too damn fly Don't be shy, cause I'm too damn sly Slide in the slides, call me the fox Look the keys to your heart, cause I'll pick the locks Opening my mind to see what I find so not that good to get my thoughts all aligned I place for days When you walk in the room, all you see is haze Reminisce on your crooked ways It's not a phase, I do this to amaze Running this life in a complex maze But let me keep it simple I'll pop you like a pimple if you mess with your boy Like a new like just a hoy boy and it's the holy water instrumental show my full potential Cause this shit is definitely essential I don't fuck with snakes, I don't fuck with rats I don't fuck with pigs with a photo on my Facebook newsfeed But me, I don't give what is the swine Believe it or not, what is divine Changing up the flow a bit just to admit that it's too legit That's too legit, I won't quit till I reach the very top Even then I won't fucking stop And the flow keeps going and I'm just showing That I can keep on flowing I leap bounds in a single leap I speak that which is Deep, and think about it, put you to sleep But no sleeping on me, so wake your punk ass up As I start to fill up my cup to the brim The just looking grim, but only for him Only for him, cause he stopped to oppose me And I'm never frozen, getting even sicker Using the flicker as a boxing style Working to a genre, no epo Shout out to all my people And this is my story, it can't get going If you don't give me the glory, so just give me the glory Glorify me, it's a fact, say narrow Say it for short, I don't know why I have to keep reiterating Cause motherfuckers, my every goal is something nobody thought And this last song is, uh, oh, that was called, um, yeah, yeah, sorry. Last, this last song is called, uh, Sounds of Tyrants. <clears throat> Silence the Tyrants, my eyes defiance. Rick your whole squad into all your lines. Untamed long range when I box and hurt some. Unbound, profound when I bless and curse them. Get us to the max, then we'll find us in the flaw With these words, I'll leave them all and all If my back against the wall, I will still stand tall Praying for my downfall, better keep praying What is it I'm saying? I'm going to be staying on the track With these words, I'm never taking back So will let every foe that I'll ever know If you're stepping on my toes, I'll bury you below I'll do it with the flow, sometimes it's moving all For those who listen, I sing please with ease Got my enemies dropping down to their knees Pleading for clemency, another a memory Make you remember me before you're dismissed Crossing another name off my list I will not stop until I bleed, I will not stop until I succeed, leave it all on a pad and jump the penguin, wrap it in the lines and there is no pretend and no deceit, all these other rappers are under my feet, I'll never taste defeat, but I have a flavor that I can savor, treating this as if I'm hip hop savor, the world in my palm, I will not fall, they want to heal us so I get the star, they can never wipe my shot, I go so hard, brigade and distant, any and every scar, charged with the flame, they cannot be doused, body and demons, I cannot be housed, in the hell to dwell, but then I tell self, it's isolation, the negotiation, Time I served, that was undeserved. It was I do, it just made me a new find a diamond in the dirt. I got the mother's touch, everyone will hold a tree. Everyone will hold a tree, extract the gold. Thank you very much, Stephen. Let's give it up again for him one more time. If a person doesn't ever get nervous, they might possibly be a psychopath. <laughs> Dear Santa, you are supremely annoying. You possess no magic, only subterfuge. For a fictional character, you have got a chokehold on so many childhoods. Nicholas of Turkey would see no reflection in our modern Santa vending machine. Our consumers' aspirations are alive and welling up in oceans of plastic. Far from flying reindeer, now we aspire for fish who can swim in microbeads and birds who have no need to breathe. 
Most of the gifts you bring don't mean shit. A week later, they are trash, along with the earth, wind, and fire. So stay home, Santa. Your, no your North Pole is melting into the Arctic Ocean. Please bring us what little fresh water remains. In glass jars, please. Your elves, long secretly thought to be sweatshop slaves, can no longer live on a diet of snowless tundra. Go home, Santa. Take your toys and go away. Maybe, if you strike a few Christmases in a row, more Christian heathens will realize the urgency. We would rather teach our kids to believe in the personification of absurd greed than recognize our material waste is larger than life. Strangling the breath from the gills of aquatic creatures, pretty soon it will be tuna and sea turtles with glowing red noses. Make it a buy-nothing holiday. Embrace the white elephant exchanges for their useful simplicity, or give time and effort instead of things. Don't go all out for a feast that no one but our arteries will remember. Have a merry little Christmas. May our days be merry and bright with only the stuff we need. And hey Santa, maybe you could stick around once we deserve your generosity. while listening to a quartet perform Santa Fever, um, which is a new Christmas song that I didn't know existed. It was all about Santa being the man. I'm like, damn right he is. All right, our final performer for the recorded open mic, please welcome to the stage the director of writing nights, How's it going? So I'm gonna, I thought of other announcements after I printed out the paper, and my handwriting is hard to read, so I'm just gonna read them. Uh, so, Red Nights has a Patreon, if you are interested in a subscription service where you can get all of the Red Nights books that come out, and some that have already come out, and can circle around to get to you, uh, uh, patreon.com slash Red Nights. Uh, we have three contests. I actually wrote two on here afterwards, and I realized we had a third one. Um, they all start in March. Um, first is Hessler, Hessler Street Fair. Uh, it's the poetry contest. Uh, basically, you send in five poems, and I pick one of them and put them into a book, and then you can read them in front of people, and then judges make a decision as to whether or not you should win money. Uh, so I won that one last year. Um, were you first, Cy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then there were two others. I don't remember who they were at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's been doing it for 40 some years, so definitely the most prestigious and longest running we've been doing. Um, the grand tournament for via Writing Nights also will open in March. Um, that has two rounds to it, a page round and a stage round. If you, be, if you are one of the top five in the Patreon, you come back for the stage round. I'm thinking of doing it at the July version of this show, just because um, when we schedule it for the last Saturday, it often conflicts with uh, Pottercrest. So try not to do that. And then we're having a 10th anniversary contest, right? And it started in 2009. Um, there will be uh, five categories, which are all on the website. I want to inspire you to go to the website to look them up. And we'll have judges, and uh, five winners will get chat books, and then we'll have a good old time hearing from the, hopefully hearing from the readers of that. Event. So yeah, that's those are the uh, main announcements I wanted to make. So Skylar doesn't have to. Oh, and uh, the three pounds of wood 
that uh, people can win at as to is right here. Nice, pencil. I know, isn't it? Um, yeah. So that uh, they also win money. So it, it's not just about the pencil. It's about the pride of getting hundred dollars from everyone. <laughs> All right. So I'm m lately mostly a novel writer, and I am working on the fifth novel of potential nine or ten, and I wanted to read the first chapter of it. Uh, the chapter title is Fashion. Um, I'm not going to explain what goes into it. I think you'll get it from the version. August 8th, 1313. I watched as a group of hulking brutes ran across the field towards my friends. There was nothing I could do. The orcs swung their weapons with a surprising amount of precision, but the humans of Sherwood Forest were faster, more agile, and able to avoid the strikes. The humans were backed by arrowmen, which could take out a fair few orcs, but eventually the giant brown brutes were able to overwhelm them. I watched carefully, studying both sides, each falling when struck by the other's weapons. Sweat glistened off the skins of both sides. The battle fought ferociously on both sides, Lee led to two orcs facing one human, my friend Neely. I couldn't save him. I had to watch the potential carnage. Neely was about my height, 5'11", but thinner. Still, his muscles were like corded wood. He was faster than the orcs, but they towered over him and were twice as wide. He flipped his weapon in his right hand and loosened up his arm as he stepped back toward one of his fallen comrades. He stooped down to grab their weapon in his left hand and stood just in time to block an attack on his left side. The orcs' arm strength was immense, but Neely knew this and moved with the strike instead of trying to parry it. The second orc stepped forward with his weapon flying down toward Neely. My friend had to jump back and nearly lost his balance as he tripped over a fallen fighter. Shit, Neely caught his balance just in time to knock the oncoming weapons out of their trajectory toward his chest. The orcs acted quickly and pulled their weapons back and thrust them again, grunting with the effort. Simultaneously, Neely thrust his weapons at each, each orc. The weapons all struck at the same time. Neely hit each of the orcs, center mass. Each of them struck him in the ribs on either side. All three fighters fell, crying out. I watched, wordlessly. A quiet moment passed over the field, littered with the bodies of dead humans and orcs alike. A human voice called out, So who won? An orc voice similarly said, Do we beat the human scum? Calmly, I called out, first in Middle English, then in Orcish. It was a tie. The final blows, the final blows struck us simultaneously. The fallen humans and orcs rose from their deaths on the field. Some were angry, but not really. Others were impressed that their opponents were so skilled. At any rate, the noise was overwhelming, but generally jovial. Both sides relished the contest and were ready to line up again. I sighed, but smiled. Keeping a band of otherworldly creatures busy and not killing everyone around them is not easy. The group of orcs left over from the antics of the black god Morthegos often got restless. It was their natural inclination to explore and pillage and plunder, but that would have been disastrous for the British Isles. I wasn't even... It wasn't even like they were especially violent, they were just large. Quickly, the line of twenty orcs took their stances on one side of the field, framed by the trees of Sherwood Forest. forest. On the other hand, on the other side of the field was the twenty humans. In the hands of the orcs were not their typical weapons, metal axes or swords or warhammers. Instead, they held large sticks wrapped in thick wool and leather. The humans held their bows and arrows, but the arrows were blunted and covered in similar wool and leather tip. For close combat, the humans had thinner sticks, wrapped similarly, both for speed and precision. I stood in the center of the field. In Middle English, I said to the humans, Are you all ready? They cheered and raised their middle fingers to show off their ability to pull their arrow strings to take down their enemies. They got this from my friend Diana. In Orcish, I said, Are you all ready? The orcs roared and raised their, their weapons. They didn't understand the middle finger gesture. They were mad enough as it was. It didn't tend to like humans on average. I was one of the exceptions, probably because I looked like them. My skin was darker than the average human in Sherwood Forest. Also because of Morthegos, I had the ability to speak and understand Orcish flawlessly. I felt bad keeping the orcs cooped up in the forest. They were not used to so many trees. It reminded them of elves, and they hated elves. The residents of Sherwood Forest tried to treat the orcs with respect and amicability. It helped that the, the current Robin Hood was my best friend, Neely. The merry men were just glad to have new people to cavort with. 
The problem that arose was recreation was so different for orcs and humans. Orcs preferred wrestling or boxing games, but a solid punch from an orc could cave in a human skull. The humans offered archery tournaments as an alternative, but the orcs were staunchly against archery, calling it fighting for cowards. It's hard to tell an orc not to go full strength when they're trying to win a boxing match. It's even more difficult to get a drunk English or Scotsman to back off when they're called a coward. My solution? A non-lethal combat game both sides could enjoy. Dusk peppered the sky with darkness. At the edge of the forest, I sensed my current lover. Okay, I called out. Last fight. Make it count, folks. I backed up to, off the battlefield, intending to sneak away with her after I started the battle. I yelled, go, in modern English. It was the word I could use both sides could understand at the same time. The battlefield filled again with the roars of the combatants. I stepped backwards into the tree line and turned into a kiss from Seibel. Her soft kiss, her soft lips pressed against mine lightly. She threaded her fingers into my long brown hair. Her brownish black hair was longer than mine, but not as thick. When I met her, it had been shaved on one side, but she was allowing it to grow in. She wore a pe white peasant blouse tied in front, but showing off her cleavage. As someone who had knowledge of the future, it was an anachronistic look, but Seibel often relayed to me her distaste for women's garb at the time. She sewed her own shirts and form-fitting cotton pants, which allowed for full range of movement. I knew she had walked here. If she had come in dragon form, she'd have worn her robe. Or maybe I just walked naked through Sherwood until I got to your hut, she said. I would not put it past you, I replied. She smiled. What are you implying? That you're proud of your body and do not mind showing it off, I said. I similarly didn't like men's fashions of the day, but I had more options. The clothes I wore when I was pulled through the portal months earlier had been destroyed by my various adventures, so, my, so I wore a button-up tunic which draped below my ass, just barely, and tights which came up over my ass from the bottom. The wool made me itchy, so I set about finding cotton and found a seamstress to put a few pairs together for me. I made sure there were holes where my wings could extend if needed. If only my friends could see me now. I do not know who your friends are, she said, but I am sure they miss you. I sighed. Maybe. I lived under such weird circumstances. You were abducted. Yeah, but there are so many unfinished things, so many words I was not able to say. There will always be unfinished things. There will always be so many words unsaid. One cannot allow oneself to suffer because of it. I smiled, but in the darkness, I'm sh not sure if she could see. I can feel your smile. Come to bed. Yes. My hut wasn't far, and the campfire near us lit the way well enough. I heard a commotion coming from the battlefield, and it wasn't a good-natured arguing post-fight between the orcs and humans. I ran through the trees, carefully navigating so as not to crash into one. Once I reached the clearing, the half-moon illuminated between the clouds. A man figure stood surrounded by two fallen orc bodies and the three fallen human bodies. Surrounding the figure was the rest of the contingent, held at bay by his long, double-edged sword with a long handle and thick pommel. The blue and green tassel of the sword hung to the side. The fallen fighters at his feet were melting and covered in some kind of dampness. Who the hell are you? I yelled in Middle English. And what was some form of Cantonese? The response came, My name is Jin Long. I am seeking the one known as John Ross of the Clan Gerstung. Thanks. Thank you, Azra. Give it up for Azra again. All right. As Azra turns off the recording. The best time to write. Oh, yes. The best time to write is. No! The best place to write is. Here! And the best people to write are. Yes! Us. Yay! Okay, now we're going to turn off the Facebook Live. Sure are.